Okay. Well, we'll get started. Thank you all for joining um, today. Uh, as you know, this is a webinar that um, we are offering with, in collaboration with the Area Health Education Centers who are providing the continuing education. So if you want the CE credit, please make sure that you put your name and email address in the chat box so that we have that to send you a follow-up evaluation. So I'm very excited to um, introduce our panelists in just a minute. We are starting a, a new thing here at the uh, Kansas Center for Cultural Competency Advancement and are going to be hosting some webinar series around the topics related to cultural competency, diversity, and inclusion. And so today we have four fabulous uh, presenters who are going to talk about social determinants from rural and urban community perspectives. So our objectives today are to describe social determinants of health, explain how the determinants of health impact health decision making, compare barriers to accessing healthcare services in rural and urban communities, discuss community initiatives to support individuals and families who have limited access to health promoting and health supporting activities and resources. So our panelists today are Jerry Jones, Lucia Jones, Michelle Levy, and David Toland. And I'm sure they will tell you a little bit more about themselves um, in a minute. I want to give a brief introduction to each one of them, though, first. So Jerry Jones is the exec Executive Director of the Community Health Council of Wyandotte County. And in his role, he's had the opportunity to work closely with hospitals, safety net clinics, academic institutions, public health departments, and funders in designing improved health seeker and health provider experiences. Um, I'm sorry, I just, hold on, okay. Current projects he, he is leading are reducing disabilities and deaths related to diabetes, heart disease and stroke, health insurance enrollment through a program called Enroll Wyandotte, connecting newly insured to primary care physicians and chronic disease prevention programs, the Wyandotte County Community Health Worker Initiative, which is a partnership with KC Care Clinic and the Health Equity Through Action and Transformation for the HEAT Project. Prior to joining the Community Health Council, Jerry worked as a community organizer and co-designed grassroots strategies with residents to improve access to health. In 2012, Jerry's collaboration of hospitals, public health department, and faith communities to decrease non-emergent ED visits received the Healthcare Innovation Award from CMS. Lucia Jones is the project manager at the Community Health Council of Wyandotte County. Prior to her current role, she was, uh, was a clinical nurse at KU Health Systems. She joined the Community Health Council in 2013 to coordinate the Enroll Wyandotte campaign. Enroll Wyandotte was formed with the goal of conducting outreach and education about the Affordable Care Act. Currently, she is the project director for the Community Health Worker Collaborative for Wyandotte County. Lucia also oversees programs related to hypertension management and diabetes prevention. Michelle Levy is a research project director with the University of Kansas School of Welfare. She received her BSW from KU and Master's of Art in Social Service Administration with a certificate in Health Administration and Policy from the University of Chicago. She has over 20 years experience in research, education, training, and direct practice. She currently serves as director of the Integrated Health Scholars Program, which is focused on expanding the number of social work professionals working in integrated healthcare settings in rural and other medically served areas. And she is also currently involved in a project to engage migrant and seasonal farm workers in healthcare research. Growing up in a small town and experiencing healthcare barriers inspires her interest in rural health. David Tolan is the first CEO of Thrive Allen County and a seventh generation native of Allen County. Prior to returning to his hometown in 2008, David served as chief of staff in the Washington DC office of planning and as de deputy chief operating officer to DC's deputy mayor. 
As Thrive CEO, David has led the organization's work to develop 25 miles of new trails, obtain voter approval of a new critical access hospital, ensure passage of the third Tobacco 21 ordinance in Kansas and the ninth Complete Streets ordinance in the state and redevelop the former Allen County Hospital site into a new supermarket and apartment neighborhood, among many other projects. David was also the architect of Allen County's successful pursuit of the 2017 Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Culture of Health Prize. So please join me in a warm welcome for our forum four panelists. And I am now going to turn it over to Michelle. And you'll be starting the slides? Yes, can you see them? Okay. I cannot. Do I need to do something? Can everyone else see the slides? Is it just me? No. <laughs> oh. Well, let me. I thought I had it on share screen. I'm so sorry. It's okay. Okay, can you see okay. now? Okay. Yes. Well, let me just back up. Here are four <laughs> panelists that I just told you all about, just so you can see see another photo of them. Um, so, okay, Michelle, we'll get started. No problem. Okay, there we go. Okay. So, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to be a part of this webinar. Um, I'm going to kind of set the stage in providing an overview of social determinants um, with a focus on rural perspective, um, and then turn things over to the other presenters to talk about um, the amazing work that they're doing in their communities. So we're here today to talk about rural perspectives on social determinants because of the many health disparities in rural areas. Rural residents are more likely to report poor or fair health status. Uh, they defer getting health care uh, due to costs. There's higher rates of chronic disease and mortality in rural communities. And these disparities are not simply because individuals live farther from health care providers or other services. Um, you know, access is a part of disparities, but we're really talking about differences that run much deeper than that, um, driven by social determinants of health. Um, so what do we mean when we talk about social determinants? Um, we're really talking about all of the conditions by which people uh, are born, grow, live, work, and age. Um, this definition from the World Health Organization um, goes on to talk about um, the distribution of money, of power, of resources in our society, which impact policies and systems and structures. And it's also important to note that social determinants um, operate at both an individual and a population level. Next slide, thank you. Um, so let's back up just a moment and think about what determines our health. And when we think about our health or being healthy, I think um, a lot of us think first about going to the doctor, taking care of ourselves, getting good quality health care. Um, but as you can see, our health overall um, is largely a function of factors that um, happen outside of the healthcare system. So what happens at the doctor's office matters less to our health outcomes than health behaviors like using alcohol or or exercise or lack thereof. Um, and what actually has the largest relative influence on our health are social and economic factors, such as education, employment, and income, uh, also known as the social determinants of health. Next slide. So another way this has been characterized, maybe you've heard this before, is saying that our zip code matters more than our genetic code. In other words, we see huge differences in health outcomes um, between communities and between neighborhoods. The neighborhood that we live in can impact whether we smoke, uh, whether we eat a healthy diet, whether we practice safe sex. Um, this is true for both urban and rural areas. Um, in addition to some of the commonly noted uh, social determinants like housing, uh, nutritious food, jobs, um, a few researcher, researchers have also suggested that rural culture might be a social determinant. Um, in other words, that there's something unique about the social, structural, and behavioral norms of living in a rural community or identifying with a rural culture that make it a distinct uh, determinant with our health. Next slide. 
So when we think about social determinants, it's important to note that the determinants do not act in isolation, but in a complex and interdependent way over time. Um, we're still trying to determine exactly what the specific pathways of influence um, are, but we can talk in general about some of the ways that determinants um, do make an impact on our health. Um, first, um, determinants can cause illness directly. Um, things like contaminated groundwater um, that causes diseases like hepatitis or lead poisoning is an example of this. Um, determinants can increase our vulnerability. Um, for example, the impact of stress from racial discrimination or childhood trauma. Um, determinants can also limit or expand our choices, which in turn impacts our behavior. So for example, if the Casey's is the only place in town to buy food, then it's probably more likely uh, that we grab a pizza and a soda for dinner. Next slide. So we'd like to take a closer look at a couple of social determinants that are especially relevant in rural areas. Uh, the first one of these is poverty. Um, individuals in poverty are more likely to suffer from a variety of chronic health and uh, behavioral health conditions. Um, here you can see the rate of depression for those in poverty is twice as high as it is for those who are not in poverty. Um, a study that was conducted in 2011 found that I think they tracked something like 30,000 uh, people across a three-year period and found that for those with lower incomes, they were at a greater risk for every single mental health condition with the exception of alcoholism. In addition, when we look at premature death, poverty is a larger risk factor than obesity or heavy alcohol consumption. And rural areas experience poverty um, at a higher rate. And this is particularly true when we talk about persistent poverty. That means 20% um, or more of the population has been below the poverty level for the last uh, 30 years. And so earlier when we talked about pathways, um, we know that poverty is a contributor, it's a cause and an outcome of poor health. Uh, it impacts the resources that we have to take care of ourselves, both in terms of money uh, that we have to pay for health care, as well as money to provide for basic needs like food and housing. Uh, poverty is also a source of chronic stress. Um, it causes our brains to produce hormones that alter our immune systems. And because of this, growing up in poverty um, actually affects our adult health. And we see this impact even for individuals that aren't in poverty as adults. Um, so if you grew up poor and now you're in the middle class, um, your adult health outcomes more closely resemble those of impoverished adults. Um, those higher rates of depression that we talked about, having more chronic illness, even though now you have adequate levels of resources to pay for food, for housing, for health care. And so this is one of the reasons why it's so important for us to be here today kind of talking about prevention and the impact of social determinants early in life. Sorry, that's the whistle with changing classes here. Um, next slide, please. So social isolation um, is another determinant that is um, of particular relevance in rural communities. Uh, people with a greater number of social relationships live longer. They are less likely to be depressed. They're less likely to experience severe cognitive decline as they age, and they appear to recover more rapidly from illness. Um, as you can see, um, like poverty, the impact of social isolation is pretty significant, um, as damaging as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Um, it's also a greater risk factor than um, obesity or not exercising. And when we think about social isolation, um, especially in rural communities, I think we often think of older adults that are living alone. Um, but again, it's important to think about um, social is isolation across, um, across the life course. And a study that came out in 2016 um, looked at social connections like the um, structure of relationships, the quality and quantity of relationships that a, ha a person had um, at different points in their lifetime. So they looked at adolescence, they looked at 
um, young adulthood, middle adulthood, and then late adulthood, and found that the impact of social relationships or the, or the lack of social relationships um, actually starts um, very early in life. Um, so again, um, something we should be thinking about and talking about as we think about um, prevention and early intervention. And we'll so, okay, I'm just gonna say one more thing about um, social is isolation in relation to um, social determinants. I know a lot of times we think about social determinants as, as having kind of a negative impact or negative connotations. Um, and I think this is a good example of, you know, a determinant that can be a particular challenge in a rural community, but at the same time, I think social connection is also a real strength of many of our rural communities. Um, I think uh, many of these communities have kind of a culture of, of helping, helping one's neighbors and sort of all being in this together. And so I think that it's important also to think about uh, the ways that social determinants can uh, be a positive impact. Um, so I'll now turn things over to David. Um, he's going to talk a little bit more about some of the innovative things that his organization is doing to promote health equity and address social determinants at a community level. Thanks so much, Michelle, and thanks to everybody who's on the webinar today. Um, I'm going to give you a little context uh, from um, a community that is similar to the vast majority of, of communities across Kansas, and that's Allen County. Um, we're in um, we're in a place with 13,000 people and running what is really a quality of life coalition now, but which started exclusively around healthcare access. Um, we've gone from just working on healthcare access to building trails, recruiting medical providers, um, conducting traditional economic development, um, and a whole host of things in between. This is all done, though, with the idea that we want to be the healthiest rural county in the state. And um, while we have that lofty goal, I, I've got to be honest and say that in the most recent um, county health rankings, we're number 86. So we have a long ways to go, but we have set that goal. Could have the next slide, please. So just to orient you, Allen County is um, about two hours from everywhere, two hours from Kansas City, Topeka, Wichita. Um, and, and we're in Southeast Kansas, which if you're familiar with, with um, the county health rankings and really any, any ranking about well-being in Kansas, um, Southeast Kansas counties tend to be at the bottom. Um, this is a, an area that for a century has been in decline. That's a decline in economic conditions, health conditions, decline in population. And so we have we have residents here who are accustomed to assuming that tomorrow will be worse than today. And, that, and so when you combine that with, with the remoteness of where we are, which makes you feel alone, and, and frankly, uh, we are alone in, in a lot of regards. You need to get to a specialist. It's two hours. If you have transportation challenges, you often can't get there. Um, you need to go to the VA, um, that's, that's two hours. You name it, we are, we are in a place that is, is challenging in terms of our ability as residents to access the services we need to live our lives. And that's not just on the health side, that's also things like shopping, um, uh, things like cultural events. So this physical isolation has, has a profound influence on how we see ourselves, and how we live our lives. Next slide, please. So, um, Michelle mentioned that social isolation can have the physical effect on your body of, of 15 cigarettes a day. Um, you know, many of the people in our county and our neighboring counties and across Kansas and, and the Midwest are in places where they may go um, three days without seeing another person. Um, people tend to work in solitary um, professions. Agriculture in particular is, is uh, one where you, you may spend 14 hours a day by yourself in a combine. Um, if you go into town to see people, the hope is that there's still a cafe, but in many places like here in Allen County, the place where you might have gone to drink coffee 
with the farmers down the road might have gone out of business. Um, your church may have closed. Um, your, uh, your Lions Club or Rotary or Ruritan, civic clubs have ceased to function. And that's because um, people have died off and there hasn't been anyone to take their place. And often, if we're talking about businesses, the economics simply don't work for those businesses to continue. Um, a prospective buyer couldn't get the financing. And so what you find is that the cafe in the town of 500 that you know, had a steady stream of, of people in it for, for 50 or 60 years, um, it closes one day. And those people no longer have a place to go. And so that, that really has a profound impact on, on people's health when you don't get the opportunity to, to see your neighbors and to converse and to uh, complain about your aches and pains or complain about the weather. Um, it, it really um, can impact uh, social, uh, emotional health and, and overall well-being. Um, you, you see the, the farmers, sorry, could you go back? Um, the, the farmers on the right there um, are characteristic of what you see in just about any small town around the country. Um, and we've found as a coalition that often those guys, while they may be soft-spoken, they are really the key to making progress in, in addressing um, health inequities in these rural communities, but you know, it's you've got to have places to meet with them, and so social isolation really is um, is a challenge for us. Okay, next slide, please. Also relevant within Kansas um, is with budget cuts from the state. There has been a steady reduction in the availability of services. Uh, Allen County has, for as long as anybody can remember, had a DCF or uh, prior to that SRS office, um, a, a place where you go to get food assistance and a variety of other assistance. Um, as the state has continued to um, uh, experience revenue shortfalls, those facilities are being shuttered left and right. And so we're now at a point in Allen County where our DCF office closed um, a few months ago. That means that the 13,000 people in, in our county have to travel to the next county um, to that facility. Um, the, the folks that uh, were in the county surrounding us that had been using the Allen County facility now have, um, where they might have had a 20-mile drive, they may have a 40-mile drive. And so again, geography really matters, and we have been um, hit time and again um, by uh, the, the situation in the state um, on just being able to, to have basic services for people that are um, living in poverty. And so again, it's, it's a body blow um, to rural folks. Next slide. So let me, let me give you some examples of what we're trying to do as a community. And, you know, so um, Jill mentioned that one of our initiatives at Thrive was to build a new critical access hospital. And we were able to get that done because um, I think first there is awareness in the community of, the, of how vital it is to our survival as a community that we have access to healthcare services. But also we were able to get it done because we had a concerted effort that involved people across the county that involved meeting folks in their living rooms and, and in the cafes that are left and at their civic clubs and talking about what does the future look like and talking about you know, people's aspirations, not only for themselves, but for their kids and for their grandkids. And, and key to all of this was getting a, a new hospital and making sure that it's gonna be the type of top-notch facility that we can use to attract new medical providers. Um, like most rural communities, um, a majority of our providers, when we started at Thrive 10 years ago, were at retirement age. Um, we only had one under the age of 50. Um, 
with this new facility, we have been able to attract new uh, physicians. We've been able to get new dentists into town. Um, and that has, has made a big difference. But we had to have, um, we, we had to make that investment. Now you see on the left, um, advocacy around issues that matter to our hospital has been very important. And so we have aggressively um, advocated for an expansion of Medicaid in Kansas because for our little county hospital, that means an extra million dollars a year. Um, for the county hospital uh, south of us in Neosho County, it means I think 1.8 million. And you consider that there are county hospitals in I think about uh, 85 of the 105 counties in the state. Um, it's, it's vitally important to rural Kansas that Medicaid be expanded. Um, and so as a community, we have taken this on as a priority. And, um, you know, we're, we're not there yet, obviously, but we see it all as fitting together. Next slide. So transportation, um, when you're talking about a, a county with 505 square miles and only 13,000 people spread out across that 500 square miles, transportation is a major challenge. When we started, um, we really focused on transportation um, to get people to out of town medical appointments. So the nearest FQHC was 80 miles away in Pittsburgh. And so we set up a transportation system of volunteers who would transport um, those who needed to go to the FQHC 80 miles one way and then 80 miles back. And it was a cumbersome way to do it. And, um, uh, but it was all we had at the time. Fortunately, we were able to recruit um, an FQHC to Iola in Allen County and bring the services here, which helped quite a bit on that. There's still a need for specialty services out of county, but um, we were able to cut down that need quite a bit. That said, um, the, the reality of rural poverty is that a lot of times, if people have a vehicle, it's gonna be broken down. Um, we have a, a large percentage of our residents who work in hourly wage jobs where they're making nine, 10, $11 an hour. And so reliable transportation is, is not a reality for most folks. Um, we tried to tackle that through both expanding services uh, provided by the county government for seniors and providing new bicycle related services. So we've established a countywide bike share, which has about 40 units spread out from Iola, which has 6,000 people, down to Savinburg, which has 90 people. And bikes are available for free and um, they're, they're easy to check out. And as I said, they're distributed. Um, notably, uh, we're, we like to tell the story of one of our our residents came in, checked out a bike, promptly rode straight to the Allen County Hospital emergency room um, and uh, was checked in and admitted and ultimately shipped out. Um, he didn't want to bear the expense of the ambulance ride, so he rode a bike, one of our bikes, to the hospital, and that was his form of transportation. It, it sounds... Um, uh, it sounds apocryphal, but it's it's a true story, and um, that is that is what we're dealing with on a regular basis. Um, but but transportation is really, um, you know, it, it's almost the holy grail of this work. Um, as much as I appreciate the bikes that we have and some of the expansions we've been able to do with with county bus and and having volunteers, the reality is it's going to be very difficult to have a a permanent transportation system. Um, like what you see in an urban environment, because we simply don't have the population density to support it. So we've got a ways to go. Next slide. So David, I'm gonna have you maybe share the um, your next slide and then we're at um, 1231 and then I'll switch over to Jerry if that's okay. That's great. Okay. And so finally, uh, food access. 
has been a critical part of our work. So I mentioned that um, the Marmoton, that, that grocery stores and, and other institutions aren't economically viable, at least within the, the private market. You can't get financing and so forth. The model we've tried to take is to have community owned stores in, in small communities. So in Moran, we've got over 100 residents who have signed on as owner members of their little grocery store and we are purchasing, the community is purchasing that store from the private owner who's had it and is ready to retire. If the community doesn't do that, that store will not exist any further. And so we've done that. As well, um, in, in a larger community in Iola, we've gone toward um, a, a somewhat subsidized model of providing county incentives to construct a new supermarket in a USDA food desert. And we've done that in the middle of town in, an, in a neighborhood where quite literally the only place to get food was Casey's General Store. And um, we built that store on the site of our old hospital. So taking um, the infrastructure and, and uh, you know, this publicly owned site and turning it into a place that is accessible to the whole community. And so that's something we're really proud of. So I'll close with that and thank everyone. Great, thank you so much, David and Michelle. I am going to uh, stop sharing just briefly um, to remind everyone if you've just joined and you want continuing ed credit, please make sure that you uh, use the chat box to give us your name and your email address. So now I'm going to turn over to Jerry, who's going to talk about um, the Health Equity Action Transformation Project. All right. Thanks, Jill. Thanks, everyone, for joining. I always enjoy going after David. Um, it's a difficult act to follow, but we're, we're going to try. Um, and I really appreciate it, uh, David, what you presented. And we always talk about here at CHC, this is, you know, you know, Thrive Allen County is who we want to be when we grow up as an organization. Um, so uh, the Health Equity Action Transformation Report really started, um, you know, with the idea of trying to understand what was behind our poor county health rankings. When the first rankings came out for 2009, Wyandotte County ranked last out of 105 counties. And since the first release of the rankings, we've been at or near the bottom. Uh, in both um, uh, social factors or, or social determinants, uh, which uh, we spoken about earlier, uh, as well as um, health outcomes. Um, so if you want to advance uh, the slide. Um, and uh, so we really wanted to get kind of underneath the hood, like where is this happening? Who's it happening to? Um, and can we begin to identify um, the most um, at-risk areas and then how might we think about how we're engaging um, folks in those um, respective communities. Um, next slide, please. Uh, real quick then, just, um, just kind of what we were using, the social determinants of health, uh, which was so uh, well um, presented on earlier. Um, Jill, next slide, please. Um, so here, um, is a map, and we have a link, and, and you'll get the uh, access to the slides. One of the things that we wanted to do with uh, those data is that we wanted to try to make them as interactive as possible, so people could really get an understanding of when we were talking about Wyandotte County, we're not just talking about a monolith, but we're actually talking about different uh, neighborhoods. And so on this particular slide, uh, we we overlay uh, a lot of, uh, of the vulnerable populations and overlay it with the actual neighborhood map. So each section, as you'll see, kind of represents a different neighborhood. This particular slide, we're, we're, we wanted to highlight age. Um, and as you can see, the darker shade represents where um, the higher the highest percentage of children live. And I, we wanted to show this because as we go through the slides, we want you to get a sense of, of who the people are um, that are really most adversely affected um, by uh, our poor social health and health outcomes. Um, next slide, please. And so um, 
the analysis for this project was conducted uh, by the Kerwin Institute for the Study of Race and Ethnicity. Uh, they're based out of uh, Ohio State University. And um, one of the things they wanted to do, they wanted to take the social determinants, and they also wanted to really look at how we might break this down. So really looking to kind of drill down and say, okay, let's look at other things too, as far as foreclosure rates, poverty rates, um, and things of that nature, to kind of get a, a real sense of some of the actual challenges um, that individuals in our particular community are, are facing. And so these indicators really were combined with the traditional social determinants of health to really help us try to, to name what is the level of comprehensive opportunity for health in the county. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and again, so this particular map that you're looking at now, we are looking at the correlation between opportunity and race. And so what you'll notice, so there's like a, in the middle of this, of this miniaturized map, there's a dividing line. Uh, what the map, you're, what you're able to do is first you're able to see what the level of opportunity is. One of the things you'll notice is that the darker shade of brown means the higher the level of opportunity. Um, the lighter shade uh, represents very low opportunity. And so what we notice in our county is that the further west you go, the higher the opportunities are. Um, the further east you go, the, um, the worse the opportunities become. And so I just wanted to refer to you that the further east is where most of our school-aged children live. It is also where a great number of our seniors live. Um, so where Wyandotte County is situated, uh, we are, we're, I should back up and say that Wyandotte County, um, interesting dynamics, Wyandotte County, uh, we are the western, or sorry, easternmost point of the state, so we butt up against the state of Missouri. We're separated uh, by the Missouri River. Uh, we are also uh, next door to Johnson County, which ironically enough is the wealthiest county in the state um, and traditionally ranks in the top 25 for wealthiest counties in the United States. And so um, there's that interesting dynamic between the have and have nots. Uh, that Wyandotte County faces. Um, so the further east we are, the worse the opportunities are. Uh, the other side to this slide, if we, if you were to take, when you go to this website, when you slide that bar to the left, and we won't be able to see it here, what you'll be able to see is um, the race uh, and cultures of folks who live in those respective areas. One of the things you'll see is that the further east, the more likely the residents are to be African American, uh, Latino, um, they are also um, more likely uh, than not to be unemployed, undereducated, so on and so forth. Um, next slide, please. So uh, one of the things that we wanted to look at and to highlight was um, what is causing um, our folks, um, you know, sickness and, and actually what's killing our people. Uh, and so what you're looking at are uh, different maps um, looking at mortality based off of stroke, heart disease, cancer. Um, and it, it is somewhat fairly distributed amongst um, the different parts of the county, but we do see some higher concentrations of uh, heart disease um, and uh, cancer and stroke uh, on the eastern part of the county. Um, the upper left-hand quadrant, really, we're trying to uh, capture the average age of death. And one of the things that we saw from the data um, is that the further west you go, the longer you live. And the further east you go, the sooner you will pass away. And there's about a 21-year gap between where Lucia and I are sitting today and the area where we have NASCAR, Speedway, and the legend. So, in about a 20 minute drive, you pick up about a year per minute while driving from east to west. That, so that's the gap in Wyandotte County. Uh, Jill, next slide, please. Um, Wyandotte County has a dubious distinction. Um, our infant mortality rate amongst um, African American women is historically amongst um, the worst in the nation. 
Um, typically, uh, we are anywhere either we have the worst or we're in the top five for worst uh, infant mortality rates amongst um, African American women uh, in Wyandotte County. The infant mortality rate amongst uh, Latino women is also uh, very poor. Um, we we have some data, and we we don't know if it's an anomaly. We have to do a little bit better research. Uh, but we saw infant mortality rates very high in an area called Armordale, which is one of the industrial districts here. Uh, that's surrounded by railroad, by highway, um, and so some very alarming trends that we think might be there as it relates to the infant mortality rate amongst Latino women. But just wanted to highlight that for a county, um, we we have challenges with uh, keeping our our babies alive uh, through their first year. Um, next slide, please. So, this real, and not to, to belabor the point about the data themselves, but Children's Mercy and KU Med Center provided uh, their data of their emergency departments to really try to help us understand where uh, the most uh, at-risk areas are in our uh, in our particular county, um, and we want to maybe jump to uh, the the next heat map side to kind of show uh, where a lot of our emergencies are coming from. Okay, so this is reflective of KU's adult population. And so the, the brighter the red, the, um, the more likely that there is a, there's a, a, a ED hotspot. And so what we're looking at is for individuals who uh, have had multiple ED visits uh, within a given period of time, You'll notice at the bottom uh, right-hand corner of this map that H represents KU, and then right adjacent to it is a hotspot. Um, we believe there's a couple of there's uh, senior living facilities, there are other low-income housing, but you could see this eastern part of the county has more uh, ED returns compared to um, the further further west. Um, next slide, please. And then again, this is for Children's Mercy. So you have the adults, now we're looking at the children. And you'll see that there is a little bit of overlap, but you see that large area, that red area. Um, this is uh, very troublesome. When you're thinking about, these are um, largely um, Latino children um, who are, or having to rely on the emergency department. So this, for us, we feel like this is highlighting a lack of access to primary care, especially for individuals who uh, speak a, a language other than English as a primary language. Uh, but then you can see there's tons and tons of yellow, especially in this easternmost part. So between African American and Latino, this is a large part of that population who are making uh, multiple ED visits, which tells us that they're relying on the emergency department um, in, in large part for non-emergent or in some cases primary care. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and then we can skip this slide as well. Thanks, Joe. Um, so one of the things that came out in the analysis um, was we, we were trying to figure out, and, and David had mentioned it in his presentation about geography and how much geography matters. One of the things that we wanted to look at, we were like, okay, well, we see all these people coming um, to the emergency room. We see all of these different things, but why is it this way? Why is Wyandotte County um, perennially amongst uh, the worst health outcomes and social determinants when generally most of the other counties that are near us are, are rural in nature? So we wanted to try to understand what was happening. So our researchers asked us to figure out if we could get any information regarding um, how homes were assessed and values were assessed. And, and we, we started digging and we made it back to the 1930s. And what we began to find was that there was some uh, systemic policies that had put, were put into place that really kind of shaped the current status of Wyandotte County's economic uh, and um, overall um, community health. Um, next slide, please. 
So what we're looking at here is um, one of the, what is now we refer to as a red line map. So um, during the Roosevelt administration, um, we had, um, we had lots of, we, we'd come out of the depression and uh, banks were a little, you know, you know, squeamish about reinvesting in communities. So one of the things that uh, during the administration Congress came up with was they passed a, a federal housing act. And as part of that act, they created the homeowners loan corporation. And the idea was that they were going to, the government was going to insure um, loans. So banks, they're telling the banks, hey, you go out and you lend to people and we've got your back. And so as part of that, they dispersed agents across almost 240 cities. And their whole job was to, to assess risk. Um, how much, you know, if we invest money in a particular area, what's the likelihood that we will be able to get a return on our investment? Um, and as you can see on this residential security map, you know, green was gray. Green was a home run, slam dunk, no way you're going to lose money. Um, kind of the B or the blue group was like, it's pretty solid. It's not perfect, but it's, it's good enough. And then C, C is risky. So a yellow score it means there's risk, but, you know, maybe they're worth taking a bet on. And D... Um, the fourth grade or the red areas were absolutely not. Under no circumstances are you to, to make an investment uh, in these communities. Uh, that's where the term redlining comes from. And as you can see, uh, this upper corner here, uh, this is Kansas City, Kansas. So if you, there's a, an area that looks like a, like a highway or a train, like railroad system, just to the left of this, you start seeing a huge red area. That is the same area that we were discussing earlier uh, about um, the easternmost part of the county, uh, where we're getting the worst health outcomes, where we're seeing early uh, uh, early death. That's the Wyandotte County. This is actually where Lucia and I are sitting at this very moment, and as you can see, it's predominantly red. There's no green at all um, in Wyandotte County mostly red, some yellow, and a smattering of blue. Um, but essentially, what the, the lenders decided is that this part of Wyandotte County was not worth investing in, particularly the people who lived in these areas were not worth investing in. Um, next slide. So Jerry, I'm gonna have you maybe talk about this next slide, and then if it's okay, can we transition over oh, to Lucia to talk about the community health workers? Yes, okay. yes, absolutely. Uh, just real quickly, what you're looking at here, so each assessment, so every single neighborhood in every single city was assessed. And each person was responsible for making notes. Um, and, and I can send it separate from these slides, but we can show you the actual forms that the assessors had to fill out. But as we can see, there's a correlation between what, you know, the words that were used and what you, how you would receive a red line designation. For Wyandotte County, the word that was used most often was Negroes. And you can go, you can look at all 239 cities, and the number one reason why a neighborhood would receive a red line score is, is the word Negro and the presence of Negroes in the community. And we just wanted to highlight that because when we're talking about health improvement we feel like it is impossible to talk health improvement without talking about and addressing health equity and there's a systemic challenge that we have uh, in Wyandotte County that is a very heavy lift and I'm going to let Lucia talk a little bit about how community health workers are working to address well, I, just, I, I wanted to interject really quickly as I move through the slides to Lucia's um, here we go. But that systemic racism is a social determinant of health that we don't always talk about. So I'm glad that you mentioned that, um, or you, you were addressing that in, in, in the work that you've done with the redlining. So now I'm going to turn it over yeah. to Lucia to talk about the Community Health Worker Collaborative Report. Lucia, do you want me to um, get the video up for you, or do you want to share a little bit uh, let's see. Let me, I'm looking at the time. 
Um, so the video is three minutes, and it really, I love the video. I think it gives an idea of what the CHWs are, and I can slice through some of the data. Um, so if you can access that, good. Okay. Otherwise, I can just start. So do you, do you want to talk just briefly about your the project, yeah. and then I'll turn it over to the video? Sounds good. Ab absolutely. So um, the Community Health Council of Wendler County partnered with Kasiker Clinic, and I don't know who is here in the area, but Kasiker Clinic is an, um, a, an FQHC here in Missouri who has one of the largest community health working programs in the metro area. So what we wanted to do was to um, implement a team of community health workers that will uh, provide services um, here in Wander, in Wander County with the goal of addressing some of the barriers to care. Next. So okay. let me, Whatever you prefer. I'm going to, I'm going to show the video now. Okay. You can see it, Perfect. correct? Yes. Community health workers are the goodwill ambassadors of the healthcare system. This is what care can and probably should look like. The role is to connect individuals to services. It could be clinical services, social services, we're talking about food access, we're talking about house. Whatever the client feels they need to achieve their healthcare goals. When you get to their house and realize that they did not have a doctor to see them, they were in a lot of pain and they needed someone to support them and guide them. So that's where I stepped in. I went to their homes and they don't have anything. They don't have furniture, like only a couch. Kids don't have any toys and they're very young. So first of all, I care about people who are folks who want to make a difference in the community. To me, it's like a fulfillment. Like, you get so happy every day. I help people every day. I try to change their life. The client that I saw today had a bottle for her cough. The prescription was helpful. It, what confused her was she didn't know where to get it. They just need someone to direct them. They just don't know where to get it how to get it. We just help them figure it out and as best as we can. We try to figure out how to make it as easy as possible to, to get done what you need to get done. Sometimes they have the language barriers and I believe today when I came here I didn't know any English. These are individuals that usually come from the community they serve. They have experienced a lot of the struggles and the barriers that the community they're serving has experienced. So they give them that knowledge empathy that not everyone can have unless you go through those things. To have the community health workers going door to door, reaching out to people, diverse people, helping them understand the program that they have and how to use it has been transformative. I see people smiling. When they get help, I can see the pain releasing from them. And just amazing story after story of folks who without these workers actually seeking them out and helping get them to the insurance and the providers would never have gotten help. I'm very fortunate. I mean, for real. I'm, I'm doing what I want to do. Coming to work for me is like never going to work. It's just like this happiness that you see in, in people's face. They're able to bring that emotional support that is key for people to do well. I think that's called just empathy. And I think that most of the individuals that go into healthcare or do what the community workers do have that. You don't know how many hugs I've seen from folks, you know, when they finish up here and they're just so, just so very grateful. But I think the health workers would say that they're just as grateful. We're working hard to change the system to help the people that is kind of lost in the system right now, but with the hopes that we can have a better system on the future. Thank you, Jill. I don't know if you guys were able to hear, because we I was hearing kind of like kind of weird, but we can send it out later. Yes, I think that that would be good because we're at um, we're at twelve fifty six. Yes. <laughs> and, um, so I, I I'm so sorry. I, I feel like everyone, our panel of speakers have so much information to share. And so um, 
I have here the contact information for Jerry, Lucia, Michelle, and David. And I think we have um, about three minutes that I will just keep keep the slide up, but I believe some questions may have come through. And Kristen, do you want to share those questions? Um, there were no specific questions, Jill. There was lots of affirmation, I mean, one, appreciation for the information and um, affirmation of how powerful it is to know this. So um, there aren't any questions. And if people want to put on your own mic and your cameras now, I can actually, I, you know, I'll let, I'll let you do that. You can, I'm sorry, you can do that and um, ask your questions directly. Well, I guess um, if there aren't any specific questions, do our panelists, and I, I feel really bad. I, I'm not the best timekeeper. It makes me a little nervous about um, interrupting the presentations. So I apologize if I, um, I stepped in at any, at any time. You all, again, had so much to share, and I was very hesitant to feel like I was cutting you off, but just wanted to make sure that you could each share a little bit about the tremendous work that you're doing in Allen County and Wyandotte County. Um, so that being said, do you have any words of wisdom or any parting words that you would like to share? I'm, this is Jerry. Um, you know, I'm just so impressed with, you know, the work at Thrive and, and Michelle, I'd really like to get connected with you as well. Um, like the things that you presented with regard to the impact of social isolation. Um, like I would be interested in, in learning from you, like what the impact of, of systemic racism and, and the combination with social isolation and what that might mean uh, for, for health outcomes. I would be really interested in exploring that. Don't know. I can't. I'm looking for Michelle. Jill, do you need Michelle's um, unmuted? I'm unmuting yes. her now. Okay. And there's been some good, uh, some conversation in the chat. This is Kristen, and um, the, we are going to do an informal conversation about this session as well as other people that want to share their experience so presenters there's no arm twisting but you and or any of your colleagues would be welcome to join that it'll be less presentation oriented um, and more how does this how does this resonate with your own communities what things are you facing what resources would you share and you know you would be welcome you can just let me know or Jill it'll be over the lunch hour next Thursday the 7th or uh, the 19th of, of April and lots of people